Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today, we're going to be talking about how you can be proactive in enhancing your facility's position with cybersecurity. And to break this down for us, we have an expert, Mr. Bill Metcalf, who is the Director of Information Systems at Global Process Automation. So how are you doing today, Bill? Hi, Chris. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Oh, we're very excited to have you, sir. Looking forward to breaking this down for us because this is a very hot topic, particularly as things have gone to more and more remote type work. And maybe to get us started, can you give us a little explanation of when we hear the term industrial control system cybersecurity, what is that? Well, so it's cybersecurity basically around industrial controls. And it's a little different than a typical IT-based cybersecurity. If we think about industrial control systems or OT networks, typically we're, we're thinking about things that are on the manufacturing floor. And these things interact with the physical world, right? So in IT, a cybersecurity concern may be confidential information or bank account information, that type of thing. When we come to uh, ICS cybersecurity concerns, it's the control of boilers. It's the control of our safety systems, our environmental controls, that kind of thing. So again, the priority is a little bit different. Uh, when we start thinking about industrial control systems and cybersecurity as opposed to typical IT type of of cybersecurity engagement. Okay. Well, that definitely helps. You know, we often hear with, to get started from an industrial standpoint, a security assessment is a good place. So what should the industrial and users expect from a typical, an IT assessment? A typical assessment engagement comes down to several different things. We look at the cyber end of things, which of course is the networks and firewalls. We look at assets. So, you know, what kind of systems, what is it that we're actually trying to protect from? Typically we use standards to go by. So uh, one of the ones, and there are lots of different standards. IEEE makes a standard, SANS Institute has a standard. The one that's kind of the generic one that is open and free to all is the NIST, or it comes from the National Institute of Science and Technology. And basically, it's a set of guidelines that are developed in cooperation, I guess, with the federal government, with Homeland Security, and and industry owners, right? So the people who actually own this equipment collaborate together, and they set out a set of standards and best practices to follow. So typically, we'll use that as a baseline. And uh, we'll engage, maybe start off with a series of workshops and talk about things like policies and procedures. It's surprising as you kind of dig into it, the little things that people don't think about, where they fall is in line with supply chain, or you know, are there government standards that they're required to follow? Everybody knows about like NERC SIP. NERC SIP is in the power industry. Those are federally mandated standards that our critical infrastructure is required to follow. Recently, water and wastewater has gone into the Clean Water Act, which now is putting requirements of water and wastewater providers, or or I guess mainly water providers, as what they should be doing with cybersecurity. The regular manufacturing things that are not considered critical infrastructure, these are guidelines. These are not requirements, but they're recommendations, right? And We all know that we've seen on the news that things happen, viruses happen, there are are people out there attacking systems, whether it's to disrupt the manufacturing process. So we're seeing more and more cyber extortion, if you will. So the bad guy is looking to gain money and they don't really care whether it's a soccer mom, a hospital or a manufacturing facility. Their main goal is to basically hold your system hostage, and they use ransomware to do that. And so we're seeing a lot more of that taking place. A lot of times when I talk to customers, they're like, well, you know, I'm just a small manufacturing company in 
out in the middle of nowhere in the USA, and nobody even knows that I exist. And we always kind of refer to that as security through obscurity. And what we're finding is, is the techniques in ransomware and things like that are so widespread that you can no longer hide behind being a small company or in some remote location. If you are connected to the internet, you have that possibility of becoming a victim. Security through obscurity. We, I mean, that's a new one. So when I think through a, an assessment, so does this type of assessment from a cybersecurity standpoint differ very much from the actual work on the ground than a, just a standard network assessment that you would typically go in and do for an industrial on the OT? So we kind of break it into two different categories. There's a cyber assessment, and the cyber assessment is looking at things like policies, procedures, and it can cover things like backups, disaster recovery, what happens after an outage occurs type of thing. And we look mainly from a network and technology standpoint, we're focusing kind of at that edge of the manufacturing network. If we do just a standard network assessment, we're actually focusing, you know, there's always the focus on cybersecurity and what's going on at the edge, but we tend to focus more down into the network technologies that are used, redundancy. We run into a lot of times, OT networks tend to evolve organically. And so there's not been like the master plan, if you will, things just kind of, we add a switch here and we add a switch there. And there are uh, networking protocols like spanning tree and things like that, that can cause unplanned outages. So I would say a network assessment is more about reliability and uh, a cyber assessment would be more about securability. Thank you so much, Bill. That really helped you know, particularly, you know, connect the dots for me on the differences there. So once you have that baseline from that assessment, what steps should the end users take to enhance their strategy and and start working that roadmap? So you brought up roadmap, and and I think that that's an excellent way to explain that. So as I said, we like to follow the NIST standard because that's an open standard that is open and available to everybody. And part of the initial release of NIST, it was very dry, it was very text, and a lot of people were having a hard time kind of trying to eat the elephant, if you were. So what NIST did was that they developed a framework, and the framework basically is five steps to being able to manage your cybersecurity risk. And so the first step in any of these uh, frameworks is identify and that's to understand what your risk is what consequences are and have an understanding of where you are as far as policies and procedures do you have those in place what are your assets that type of thing and so that's kind of step one in the five step and then the next step is the protect and so typically we think of the cybersecurity assessment is that step one right so we're going to identify all of your assets, what it is we're trying to protect. We're going to identify what you have in place and where those deficiencies are. And then when we get into that protect phase, then we're going to start looking at things that we can do to improve security. A lot of times when uh, when I go to a customer's location, again, because they've kind of grown organically, there may not be a clean edge between the business network and the manufacturing network. And a lot of times people will, you know, read, go online, there's a ton of resources and our kind of tool in the toolbox for making that clear edge is a firewall. And sometimes they tend to jump ahead, if you will. And so they say, well, everybody's saying firewalls thing to do. So they'll go and they'll put in a firewall, but they've missed that piece about policies and procedures, or there are assets out there that they don't know about. So what they end up doing is they kind of get that Swiss cheese approach to cybersecurity. They've got some very solid pieces, but there's a lot of holes in it. So we always say start with identify and then make a definite plan that matches your facility and addresses your specific concerns. So from that roadmap, you're going to identify, protect, detect, and you move through those steps. Okay. That definitely helps a lot now. After that's done, I'm, I'm assuming sometimes there can be headwinds. What are the, some of the typical ones that industrial end users may see after getting that assessment completed? 
So I think probably the biggest resistance is, unfortunately, cybersecurity is is expensive, right? And there's no ROI in putting in a firewall. There's no ROI in buying switches or segmenting networks. So a lot of times the headwind is a lack of understanding. So even though there's not a direct return on your investment, there is risk mitigation. And for the most part, when we think about cybersecurity, it's about mitigating that risk. Oftentimes we spend hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars to engineer our systems to work in a specific way. If we think at the very base term of what cybersecurity or what an attacker does, the attacker basically causes our highly engineered system to operate in a manner in which we didn't plan for it. So I think a lot of times the headwind is just getting everybody up to speed, understanding what those risks are, and a lot of times people, when they talk about cybersecurity, it's the the chicken little approach, right? The sky is falling. We saw on the TV news last night that uh, ransomware shut down a facility, or we see on LinkedIn, some paper mill in Canada got hit with ransomware and they got locked out and cost them millions of dollars. And they don't offer up solutions. And I think the thing is, is that if you go to your management, if you go, whether it's at the local facility and you're talking with the plant manager and his core team, or if you're talking at a corporate level, maybe to the board of directors, maybe to a CISO or something like that, having that kind of in your back pocket to lay out, these are the risks and the potential consequences. And we have a solid plan to mitigate those risks. And I think if you do that, that kind of clears the way or, 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 you know, keeps the naysayers or the people that don't want to get into this. It kind of puts all of those concerns to rest. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Now, inside of a plant, who typically owns this process, Bill? I'm sure there's different types of roles and responsibilities, but you have a lot of experience in this space. I'm kind of curious on the different types of titles and roles that the ownership lands here. So, and again, it varies from site to site. So to give my age away a little bit, when I started with GPA was the mid nineties and a lot of the OEM were going away from those proprietary systems and going more to what we see today, you know, off the shelf network switches, PCs, operating windows, operating system, that kind of thing. And there was a bridge kind of burnt there because as the OEMs kind of went to this new model, the mill says, well, how are we going to manage this? And the IT managers not knowing the operational differences of OT and IT says, well, I see Cisco switches and I see desktops running Windows operating systems and servers running Windows operating systems. We do this all the time. We can manage that. And so they kind of started off with that approach and they tried to run it like it was an IT system. And so things like patches and updates, well, it was usually a really bad day. If at two o'clock in the, in the morning on patch Tuesday, all of your servers go down for two minutes while they reboot and applying patches. And so a lot of times the facilities that have lived through that, typically there's a very strong disconnect between process control in IT, a lot of times we always say, you know, we work to bridge that gap and sometimes it's mending fences and, and trying to get people to sit down in the room and, and have a conversation. So in those facilities, usually it's the engineering manager, it's the process control manager. If you're looking more at a corporate environment, it's the CISO who is the, the chief security officer, you know, maybe for a corporation or something like that. Those are the folks that are worried about protecting um, the OT assets. And, and like I say, typically in a corporate environment, those are the folks that have the overall responsibility to the corporation or to the individual facilities. Right, right. Now, a lot of times we're defensive so many times, but say we want to be offensive. We want to step our game up. So what can we do as owners to enhance and be proactive from that in our cybersecurity position? I think there's a couple of things that need to happen as we move forward. You know, there's the promise of industry 4.0 and digital transformation. And all of this means connecting 
our systems together and communicating more and more data from the plant floor, uh, which is unprotected, into our IT environments, which is protected. Realistically speaking, process control people are typically process control people. They're not IT engineers. They're not they're not Cisco certified administrators and, and network engineers, and things like that. They're specifically focused on keeping the machines running and programming their DCS or their TLC. So I think at some point that merge has to come back into place and we do need to get IT involved to help us with things like network and infrastructure, understanding the liability and the management. And I think to a certain extent, IT also needs to understand that the expectation is different in the OT environment than it is in the IT environment. And so as a as an owner operator, I think that it is imperative that they get their groups to work together. And I also think that it's imperative not only between the OT and the IT, but education. You know, so if the end users understand a little bit of cybersecurity awareness, they understand to don't click on the links from emails that you don't know. Some of those basic things that sound really trivial, very minor, can go a long way to help protecting the system. With the coronavirus, we've got a lot of people who are working from home, maybe even using the home computers. They can actually go a long way to help protecting their systems by making sure that their computer that they're accessing their facility is patched and updated. Make sure that you, you know, little things go away from default passwords on your Wi-Fi systems and things like that. So there are lots of things, but I think the key to that is, is communications and education. No doubt. So, I mean, I love what you said about kind of creating that synergy between IT and OT, that education piece, you know, not having your password being password, you know, the basic stuff like that, that, that we see, but we've seen it in our company too, just being in front of education and taking the lead on that, I think is so important right now. And when things do occur and, and things will happen and, and what should be the typical response if something does happen in a plant? And then that, from a recovery standpoint, can you kind of give a picture of what that looks like as well? Sure. So I guess when an incident occurs, there's a couple of things to keep in mind. So there's been a lot of studies that show that if a intruder gets into a network, oftentimes they're in the network for maybe six months or, or even longer before they're detected. So some of the things that we can do is, number one, is start watching our systems a little closer. And again, through education, understanding what that may look like and understanding. I know that I have seen situations where an intruder has been in the network and just because they're knocking around and they're not familiar with maybe some of the proprietary industrial networks, there's been like some unplanned outage. And when they go through that root cause failure analysis, they're looking at everything from there was a bearing that caused the load, that caused the motor to trip and, and all of this. And they never thought that, well, maybe it was a network problem and maybe it wasn't necessarily a life cycle type of thing where the switches just wore out and quit. Maybe somebody was in poking around. So great point. Now you, you said something that struck me that, that I hadn't, I have not heard talked about in this space yet. So the typical time could be six months or more that a threat is actually already in your system before you would start experiencing is that I hear that correctly? Yeah. So depending on the attacker and kind of what their goals are, oftentimes we hear about phishing and, and different things like that. Sometimes that phishing is just to kind of get a foothold. And then once they have a foothold on a computer, they kind of use that and they start to look at the environment that they're in. As I said earlier, a lot of times it's extortion, right? And so when they cast that very wide net, they have to figure out what they're going to charge in order to basically return your system to you. So a lot of times they'll actually get that foothold and they'll look around to see, is it just my home network where I see a couple of smart TVs and maybe a couple of lights and a laptop or something? Or am I seeing something more like a manufacturing system? Any of the ransomware messages that I have seen in the message that pops up, 
they never give you the price. It's always contact us for us to unlock your systems. And so a lot of times they get that anchor point and then they start looking, they start watching how many machines are on the network. We talk about a lot of times the uh, industrial protocols are not as secure as say an enterprise type of environment. So a lot of times they're actually seeing the data, whether it's, you know, operator interactions with a PLC or a controller or, you know, the information coming out of the system. So they, they can kind of build out and understand the magnitude of what they have control of. So yeah, that's kind of a common thing for an intruder to be in there for an extended period of time before they're actually detected. Wow. Wow. That's crazy. And so from, from a recovery standpoint after that, can you kind of touch on that? Yeah. So from a recovery standpoint, so once you've figured out that you've been compromised and like I say, in most cases, we see a lot of ransomware. So machines locked up, you can't do anything. There are several things that have to happen. And initially when we started, we talked about the NIST framework and part of that first step is making sure to have policies in place. And so hopefully you have a policy in place that tells you what to do. If not, there's going to be a bunch of people running around with their hair on fire, pointing fingers and trying to figure out what's going on. In, in many cases, in, for example, ransomware, it is a crime. And so you need to report that crime. A lot of people don't know this, but in a uh, manufacturing facility, if you are hit with cybersecurity, you don't dial 911. You call the FBI. The FBI has a team that works with NIST and others, they call it a CERT team, and it's a uh, cyber emergency response team. They will actually come to site, and they're going to collect forensic evidence to try to catch the person that infected your systems. They're going to try to catch and prosecute. Typically, the FBI tells the end user not to pay the ransom because we don't know where that cash is going, and a lot of times it's criminal enterprise. So it could be going for drugs, weapons, who knows what that money that you spend is actually financing. And so typically the law enforcement recommendation is don't negotiate with terrorists. There are cases where you have no choice. Again, if you don't have the proper procedures and policies in place to restore from backup, if that's your only set of running code that, that's been infected, you may have to pay the ransom in order to get your data back. Ideally, if you've done everything correctly, as soon as it is detected, you want to isolate the system. Again, that's where network segmentation comes in. You can isolate to a small area rather than impacting the whole facility so that it doesn't spread. And if you have good, reliable backups, you're going to start from scratch and you're going to restore backups on the systems that were affected. And then obviously there was a hole that they got in. You want to plug that hole up so that they don't just turn right around and get back in. So depending on how good your backups are, depending on how quickly you respond to this through notifying law enforcement, that type of thing, it may be downtime for a day or so. I have seen situations where basically somebody's got in, they pivoted, they did their searching of the network, they figured out that they were on the corporate network and actually affected facilities worldwide. Some of those take months to get back to normal. So that cost and the risk associated with that can be quite extreme. And then even once it's happened, the, the road back can be long and difficult. Now, thinking about from an outside resource standpoint, and a lot of our industrial end users, they love to have outsourced type support. So from this space, what outside services could they explore after they get that network back in place and to, to ensure and enhance their reliability from a security standpoint? Well, again, and I hate to keep going back to the identify step of the uh, NIST framework, but it actually calls out as part of your planning. So before the incident happens, you want to involve, as you're doing your cybersecurity, you want to involve the OEMs or the integrators, the distributors, the people that know that system inside and out. You actually want them part of your team. 
so that if something happens, you know, number one, that you've done and followed what the manufacturer's recommendations are. You've done due diligence to follow best practices. And you also have resources and allies to help you so that you're not dealing with this by yourself, right? You've got those outside people coming in. And sometimes just having third-party validation is immeasurable because somebody's looking at it from a clean slate and doesn't have a predefined expectation, if you will, uh, when they look at cybersecurity, when they look at the way that you've tried to implement different policies, procedures, and, and, and you know, different strategies to protect your equipment. Absolutely. Fresh set eyes, you know, and, and it's re- very important. And, and Bill, we call it Eco SY. We always love to get to the why. So why is being proactive in the cybersecurity approach important for our industrial end users? If you think about what happens in a cyber event, right? So we've got our highly engineered systems that are no longer working the way that we designed them to. If you think about somebody who is standing next to a piece of equipment and that equipment comes apart, there's a chance that somebody could get hurt. There's a chance that somebody could get killed. If you look at the potential impacts, so these systems are managing our safety systems. They're managing our environmental systems. So again, if things are not operating as we designed them, we can impact the environment. So whether that's local to the facility or maybe even spread out to the community, even at the very, I always say this is the best case scenario, is you take a hit to your reputation, right? You've got to tell your, your board members or your stock investors, hey, we had a cyber incident and we lost this. So, you know, you, you take a dig to your reputation. But in the grand scheme of things, that's kind of the best case scenario if that is the only impact that you have. So if, if you call it life safety, environmental safety, everywhere I go, every manufacturer that I go to, before you go in, you got to take the safety training and all of that. And every company that I go to, one of their high priorities, their, their cornerstone of their business is life safety. And if you think about the potential impact of a cyber event can be dangerous to life safety. And a lot of times I think that if people thought of it in that term, it would actually rise maybe even a little higher on their priority list to understand that the actions that they take to protect their systems also protects the life safety of their employees, their contractors, uh, the surrounding community, the environment, that type of thing. No doubt. Bill, thank you. I mean, that, that life safety point, I mean, that is the why. I mean, you, you drilled it. And I, I mean, you really unpacked a lot to be being proactive when you're talking about the map, identifying, protecting, detecting, doing that assessment. Bill, you covered a lot of ground, a lot of good resources. We'll try to link some of the, the things that you referenced uh, on the podcast for our listeners to, to go to and, and research more. And Bill, just thank you so much for taking the time with us and going through all this this detailed information to to make our industrial end users stronger and safer against cybersecurity in the future. Well, thank you. I uh, I hope somebody will take something away from this and uh, you know go ask a question, start a conversation, uh, you know make an impact on uh, on their facility cybersecurity. Thank you for listening to Eco Why. This show is supported ad free by Electrical Equipment Company. ECO is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.